Well, in two dimensions, there are Fourier methods that apply as well. So if we have a discrete space image, f of m comma n, we can take the discrete space Fourier transform, which is analogous to the discrete time Fourier transform. So in this case, we're going to let our frequency variables be u and v. There's two of them because we have two dimensions and we'll obtain the discrete space for a transform as the sum m equals minus infinity to infinity, n equals minus infinity to infinity, of f of m comma n times e to the minus j u m e to the minus j v n. What you can see here is that the sum over m, remember m is the row index of the image, so this is going down a column as we sum over m, u is the frequency associated with going down a column. So u ends up being the vertical frequency and v in contrast is involved in the sum over n which is across columns, summing across columns within a row. So v then is the horizontal frequency. And both of these have units of radians. Well the properties of the discrete space Fourier transform are very analogous to those of the discrete time Fourier transform. Perhaps one of the most important ones is the convolution property because of course convolution is one way to implement a linear shift invariant system applied to an image. So if I have a convolution in space, in other words g of m comma n is equal to h of m comma n convolved with f of m comma n, the discrete space Fourier transform of that is just the product of the discrete space Fourier transforms of H and F. So as before, we have convolution in one domain. Here we're saying space rather than time because it's two dimensions. And then we end up with multiplication in the two-dimensional frequency domain. As we think about these discrete space Fourier methods, it's useful to look at some two-dimensional sinusoids. And I've drawn some special cases here. So this is the image and we have the m index goes down this direction and the n index goes this way. So what I've sketched in this upper left image is the cosine of 18 pi over 256 n. So this is a sinusoid that has ripples in the n direction and there's no change in the n direction. This is why it looks like a series of vertical stripes because along m it's constant. Along n it varies in a sinusoidal manner. We can increase the frequency and you see the variations occur more frequently. Um, here I've got a frequency of 50 pi over 256. It's constant in the m direction and it varies more rapidly in the n direction. Now if I have a sinusoid that varies in the m direction, like this one here, I've got cosine 18 pi over 256 m. We see that it varies along this direction in a sinusoidal fashion, but in the n direction it's constant. And I can also increase the frequency, which I'm showing in the far right as a frequency of 50 pi over 256 m. So these are sinusoids that are varying in one of the directions and not the other. Now we can combine those so that we have variations in both directions like I've indicated in the bottom panel here where I've shown cosine of 50 pi over 256 n, cosine of 18 pi over 256 m. So my horizontal frequency associated with n is 50 pi over 256 and that corresponds to v and then my vertical frequency which corresponds to u is 18 pi over 256. In this image well you can see if we go along this direction that we have a sinusoidal variation of fairly high frequency in the n direction and that's because the frequency is 50 pi over 256 Whereas if we go down along the m direction, the frequency is lower. And there's a, you know, an interference pattern that occurs here. So this is a, a combination of two sinusoids. So the, our discrete space Fourier transform, of course, is not using real cosines or sines. It's using e to the minus j u m and e to the minus j v n.
And of course, the real part of these terms are just cosines. So I'm showing the real part, and you can imagine easily what the imaginary part would look like. It would be a sine version of this, which just has a phase shift of pi over 2. So these are the building blocks of our images when we do a discrete space for a transform. We're saying that we can express an arbitrary image as a weighted combination of sinusoids of different horizontal and vertical frequencies. Here's an example for the cameraman image. and I'm showing here the original image, which I believe is 256 by 256. And of course, the M direction is down and the N direction is horizontal, as we've been accustomed to. And if I take a two-dimensional discrete space for a transform, I get something that looks like this. And remember, the frequency in discrete space goes from 0 to 2 pi, just as it does in discrete time. So here we've got the 0, 0 frequency in this upper corner, and then down here we've got 2 pi, 2 pi. And it's sometimes useful to visualize this by putting 0, 0 in the center. We can do that easily enough in MATLAB using something called FFT shift, which I'm showing here. And you see that the this is just the magnitude of the two-dimensional discrete space for a transform. You see a cluster of low frequency features. Along this line here, we've got the u equals zero frequency. So those would be associated with different vertical frequencies v. And then along this line here, the v equals zero line, we've got different horizontal frequencies, u. And then these various streaks along here are associated with different edges in the image. You tend to get, when you get an edge in the image domain, you tend to get streaks in the Fourier domain that are associated with the frequencies of those edges. The vertical frequencies here, this is along this vertical line, where I've got the u, which is in the m direction, these tend to be associated with horizontal lines in the image, such as uh, there's a strong line here on the shoulder, and then there's some weaker lines in the background with the buildings, and then some of these other lines are associated with the various edges in the image, such as there's a fairly strong edge at this angle with the coat, the front, and the back, and then the tripod leg. I'm I'm going to say that corresponds to this uh, frequency here. Okay, it's fairly low frequency in the u direction, but very high frequency in the v direction, which is why we get all this stuff here. Because if I go in the u direction, where it's almost parallel to that edge, so it tends to be fairly low frequency in this direction. If I go in the other direction, the v direction associated with n, then I have a fairly high frequency because the edge is quite sharp there. Well, the discrete space for a transform is useful for analysis, but for computation we need something that we can compute. And in that case, we're going to define a two-dimensional DFT, where just as we did in one dimensions, we're going to take the discrete space for a transform and sample it at intervals of 2 pi over cap n. So we'll take capital N samples in both u and v from 0 to n minus 1 for k and l. And we'll define that as our discrete valued, discrete for a transform, f of k comma l. And here we're writing this out, assuming that the image is also n by n. We don't necessarily need to sample at the same number of pixels as there are in the image. Although, for the inverse relationships to work, we need to sample at more than that. So here I've written, then, the 2D discrete Fourier transform obtained from the discrete space Fourier transform by substituting for u and v our sampled frequencies here. This is our sampled frequency for u and our sampled frequency for v. And then it turns out that the inverse two-dimensional discrete Fourier transform is given by this expression down below. It's just 1 over n squared, the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1, the sum from l equals 0 to n minus 1 of the DFT coefficients at k and l times the corresponding sinusoids in m and n.
in this form here, you see that we are thinking about our image being represented as a weighted combinations of sinusoids in the two M and N directions. Now, as in one-dimensional discrete Fourier transform, when we sample in frequency at N points, it turns out that we get N periodicity. This has important consequences if we're using the two-dimensional discrete Fourier transform to compute things like convolution. So here's an example, our cameraman again. This image is 256 by 256. If I sample the discrete space for a transform to obtain a two-dimensional discrete for a transform, and I sample at the minimum number of samples, which is n equals 256, then I get replicates of my image every n pixels in both directions. This is just like we had, recall, when we sampled in time, we got replicates of the spectrum in frequency. Here, we've sampled in frequency, and we get replicates of the image in time. Now, if I sample a bit more densely, and I take n equals 300 frequency samples, then I get some zeros in between the images, where these black areas are zero values for the pixels. In this case, with 300 frequency samples and a 256 by 256 image, I end up having 44 zero samples in between each image. So this spreads the replicates out. It'll be something we use when we look at convolution. So if I take the DFT and I do a straightforward multiplication of the DFT coefficients, what that corresponds to back in the image domain is a circular convolution. It's the same as when we did the one-dimensional DFT. We saw that the product of one-dimensional DFTs resulted in a circular convolution. So if we want to use the DFT and the multiplication property to implement linear convolution, we're going to have to add some zero padding just like we did in one dimensions. If H is M by M and F is P by P, then the linear convolution of h and f gives us something that's m plus p minus 1 by m plus p minus 1. So if these are our dimensions and we sample in frequency at n points where n exceeds or equals m plus p minus 1, then the linear convolution can be obtained from the circular convolution. So what this means is that I'm going to take my image and I'm going to zero pad in both directions, then I will take my 2D discrete Fourier transforms, then I'll multiply, then I'll multiply the DFT coefficients, and finally I'll take a 2D inverse discrete Fourier transform of the product, and from that I can extract the linear convolution. And because there are efficient algorithms for evaluating the 2D discrete Fourier transform. This ends up being a very useful way to implement convolution or filtering on images. And that's where we'll wrap up this mini lecture, is how do we compute the two-dimensional DFT? Well, here I've written out the expression for it. Well, if I group the sum over n, and I think of m as being some constant in here, this looks just like, inside the parentheses, like a one-dimensional discrete Fourier transform over the n variable. So I can implement that one-dimensional discrete Fourier transform over n using a fast Fourier transform algorithm. And I have to do this for each value of m that I'm interested in, and there's a total of n of those values. So when I'm done, I have n log 2n for each FFT and a total of capital N of those. And that gives me a computational complexity of n squared log 2 to the n for implementing this. Once I have those one-dimensional discrete Fourier transforms, I'm going to have to implement the outer sum. So we're going to call f tilde here. It's been taken a frequency transform with respect to the n variable. So I've got l in here. This is frequency now in the one dimension. And this is image space still in the other dimension, in the m dimension. So now I have to implement another FFT for each value of l. And, and there are higher dimensional extensions of this for three and four dimensions as well.